Most of us were taught to believe in a world that is independent of us. But what if, just by observing the world, we change it? One of the founders of quantum theory, Werner Heisenberg, put it as the elementary particles and the atoms that form all matter are not real. They form a world of possibilities rather than a world of facts. Wow, a world of possibilities. I don't know about you, but that makes me extremely excited, thinking to, that I live in a world where nothing is predetermined. Well, maybe this is because um, I've traveled a lot, I've lived in many countries, and I've had a lot of difficulty deciding where I want to be at each time. In particular, when I was little, um, I lived in England, although I was born in Brazil. And although my immediate family and school friends were in one place, my 17 fun cousins were in the other place. I wanted to have all. I have wanted to have it all. I wanted to be like an ocean wave spread out between the continents. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm just one. I'm here. I'm either here or there. I'm what physicists call a particle. So can you imagine how happy I was to find out that in physics, quantum physics, in principle, myself and anything can be either a particle or a wave? Let me give you an example. So Ronaldo was shooting footballs at the goal, but to make his life a little bit more difficult, I put a barrier with two openings. The, each ball either goes through one barrier or the one opening or the other opening in the barrier. And after I shoot many, many goals, many, many footballs, the footballs accumulate just behind one or the other opening in the, in the barrier. Now, there are no footballs in the regions that are blocked by the barrier. That makes sense. But what if I do the same experiment with waves? Waves will come to the barrier, and they will go through both holes at once. When they go through both holes, two new sets of waves are born. At each opening, a new set of wave will be born and meet its, the other sets of waves. And they can meet such that a peak meets a peak, making a bigger wave, or a peak meets a valley, making a smaller wave. So this was a video in which you were supposed to see the white ball going feverishly up and down, and the, the gray ball is sort of in calm waters. And if I represent the height of the wave by the color red, and white being very calm waters. You see that big waves can be formed even in regions that are blocked by the barrier. But I can do this, which is ocean waves or footballs, with atoms, light, molecules, or electrons in well-controlled laboratories. For example, I could use photons. Now, Photons are the stuff that make up light. You know, for example, a bag of rice is made out of grains of rice. Photons make up light. And if I shine one photon onto this double slit or double opening barrier, you see that it just arrives at one place. Okay, so it's a particle, right? No. As long as I have no possibility of knowing which opening this photon goes through. It acts as if it goes through both. How do I know? Because after I shoot many, many, many photons, you can see on the screen that they form a stripy pattern, just like waves. So why do they do that? They do that because I cannot know. It's the impossibility of knowing where they are makes them act like waves. If I have any possibility of discovering where a photon is, if it goes through the left barrier, the left opening or the right opening, it acts like a football, like Ronaldo's football. Notice that I can't influence, I have no control over where the photon goes. This isn't under my control. All I have is the possibility or impossibility of knowing where it is, meaning it will act like a particle or a wave. This is very, very sort of abstract, and I know you guys are just looking at me with this face. So I was thinking, so I should, maybe for this TED talk, I should think, I don't know, what, what if we were the size of atoms? What does it feel like to be a particle and a wave? 
So thinking, 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 and I have no idea. But, so the closest I could think of was, so when, at least when I'm extremely drunk, and you sort of see triple, and sort of you guys sort of blend out um, a bit, and I'm sort of here and there. And then, for example, I don't know, my mother comes around the corner. I'm like, <gasps> act normal. And then suddenly I'm in one place. Or maybe you've never been super drunk, but you've been a kid in a classroom. And as soon as the teacher walks out the door, each pupil is everywhere. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you just can't distinguish where one pupil ends, the other begins. There are just paper balls flying everywhere. And then the teacher comes in, and voila! There's one pupil at each desk. The teacher in this example and my mum in the other example, they don't only observe that a reality that exists independent of them, they actually, by being there, they change the features of that which they observe. I know this is just a funny analogy. Please don't really take it too seriously. It's very difficult to, to see these effects at, you know, in bodies, etc. This would be another TED Talk to explain why. But um, what if you could use this wave-particle duality in experiments that could have potential applications in many fields, such as medical diagnosis or, I don't know, in technological fields, and come closer to your doorstep? So many experiments in the world are being done at the moment in this sense. And in particular, I would like you to imagine, what if I could use wave-particle duality to take a picture of you by pointing the camera over there? This is basically something that we've been, we worked on here in Vienna. So when I try to take a picture of you, usually I would point the camera towards you, of course. If it's dark, I'll turn on the flash. The flash will reflect on your face, and it will form, an, and when it reflects, it comes back to the camera and forms an image of your face onto the camera. Or, for example, I could have a spotlight. And through the spotlight, then the spotlight, there's, there's my cardboard little cat being cut out, Schrodinger's cat. And the light is going through it, and the shadow is making an image of this cat on the screen. Okay, this is fantastic. There's light going from the cat to the screen. The same as the flash, the light, the flashlight is going from you to my camera. Always to take an image, there must be light going from the object towards the camera. So what if I move this cat? over here. There is no image anymore, is there? This is basically what we wanted to do and what we realized with our experiment, using a simple tool, wave-particle duality. So these are the guys who collaborated with me on the product, and awesome scientists, and yeah, we did it all together. And how did we do it? OK, so now step away a bit from this and think of crystals. So we have these rectangular crystals. Think of Zbarovsky crystals, but even more expensive and even more special. Why are they so special? Because in these crystals, we can produce twin photons. Remember the photons that make up light? So now we produce them in pairs. They always come out in pairs. Every time a blue photon is created, it's created with a twin red photon. And even though they, all, they both go their own ways, I can find out the where, if I know the whereabouts of one, I can find out the whereabouts of the other. I actually will use two of these crystals. Why? Because I'm going to connect back to that experiment with the barrier and two openings. Remember that if we don't know where a photon is or where it came from, then it becomes a wave. And I want to use this wave-particle duality. So here, I'm going to make a situation such that I cannot distinguish if a photon pair was created in crystal, the left crystal or the right crystal. These spotlights, the red and the blue, just show the paths of these photons, and the arrows just show the direction they're going. So just don't worry about the configuration here. The most important message here is that 
by putting these blue beams on top of each other, the blue photon from the crystal one goes through crystal two, and by shuffling these red photons as if you shuffle two identical decks of cards, I cannot distinguish from which crystal a certain photon came from. For example, if a photon arrives in screen one, I don't know if it came from crystal one or if it came from crystal two. So now we already know what happens when we don't know where a photon came from. It acts as waves. And a peak from crystal of a wave from crystal one can meet a peak from a wave from crystal two and make a bigger wave, right? This is what you see with the bright spot on, on screen one. On screen two, you see where a peak of, of a wave from crystal one met a valley of a wave from crystal two. And the waves cancel each other out, making calm waters. This is what you see in screen number two. So the fact that you have a very bright spot and a very dark spot is just something that tells me, as a physicist, that these that these photons are acting as waves because they're coming sim simultaneously from crystal one and crystal two. What if I block the blue photons between crystal one and before they can get to crystal two? It's just very simple. I just get a piece of cardboard. It's nothing special. But now, look what happens. If, I, if a red photon arrives in one of the screens, I can know it came from crystal one if I also catch a photon in the cardboard because it has to be ca caught there. If a photon arrives, a red photon arrives at the screen and I catch no blue photon at the cardboard, then I know this red photon must have come from crystal two and its partner just went flying off. Get it? It's a bit confusing. But the important thing here, actually Niels Bohr, he said that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, if you're not shocked by it, then you surely haven't understood it. So if you're a bit confused right now, then you're fine. You're f absolutely fine. That's, that's where we want you. Um, so the important thing is that these two equal blocks or equal sets of photons, they just show me that the photons act as particles. OK, so this little cardboard just did this, changed wave from particle. Now I get that cardboard and put it in this experiment. So inside the cat body, you see that the blue light just goes through. So for the photons who are going inside the cat body, they're like, oh, OK, there's no cardboard. I can be my wavy self. And so that's why you see a bright cat body and a dark cat body. You see, what this picture is telling you is that there is a wave behavior of the photons in this region. But it's not of the red photons. The red photons don't even know about this cardboard thing that I put over in the blue photons. But it's just the information, the possibility of, not, of knowing or not knowing where these photons are from that make this image. You see, outside the cat body, what happens? The, the cardboard acts as an observer. It's not a conscious observer. Consciousness has absolutely nothing to do with this game. Don't let anyone ever tell you that consciousness has to do with quantum physics. It doesn't. The, what is important is the availability or not a non-availability of information. And this makes something act as a wave or a particle. And in this case, we were able to, to use this information or lack of information to produce an image of an object in a light beam that never touched the object. Very, very, very cute. Uh, I don't really get that, but, but take home message is, imagine that you are like the cardboard. So conscious or not, you shape the features of the world that you see around you. You cannot choose what you will see. This is inherently random. This is one of the most beautiful things in quantum mechanics. There is no way to calculate or predetermine what we will find when we observe. But just by observing, we definitely change the features of whatever we are observing. What happens really? I mean, you know, observe, not observer. What's really deep down? I can tell you that deep down lies a big, big mystery. And it's not a mystery that we think can be uncovered. On the contrary. Quantum mechanics 
challenges the idea that a reality exists independent of us at all. Okay, not everyone buys this. Some people really like to think that there is some reality out there. And, but then they have to have other wacky and also very complicated explanations for what we see in quantum mechanics. And usually that changes all our concepts of what is space and what is time. Einstein himself was not very convinced by this quantum mechanics business. And legend tells us that he once said to Niels Bohr, one of the founders of the theory, he said, does that mean that you know, when we're not looking, the moon is not there? And Niels Bohr said, Einstein, we will never know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>